For those of you who I don't know, my name is Debbie Freund from Claremont Graduate University, and I'm a member of the Local Organizing Committee for ASHECON. I'd like to personally thank you for attending our session today, Behavioral Economics for Altering Physician Behavior. This is going to be a really fun and informative plenary, but I have an announcement to make before we get started. And that is that the session called, quote, Behavioral Economics Interventions to Reduce Antibiotics Overprescribing, chaired by Joel Hay, that is scheduled in your program excuse me, for 115 to 245 in the law school room 130 has been changed to 3 to 430 in the same room. Same room, law school 130, but changed from 115 to a start at 3. Now to start the session, I first would like to express my profound thanks to the Commonwealth Fund for sponsoring this session and continuing to support research and health to improve access, quality, and efficiency for, the, for our society's most vulnerable. I want to single out a few people at Commonwealth for their help in securing the grant that has made this special plenary possible. First, David Blumenthal, a colleague that many of us know, who's president, and expressed his support right away. I got a phone call with him right away, and away we went. And most importantly, or equally importantly, to Mark Zeza and Anna Marie Audet and Dominique Hall, I think Mark is here, I don't know if Anna Marie made it, who greatly helped Tonali Sasso and me through the entire grant process and also thinking very formatively about how to structure this session. Thank you so much to both of you and everyone for Commonwealth who might be here but that I did not acknowledge. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our three presenters. We're going to have three papers of about 10 minutes each, and then we're going to open it up for questions. And we'll, I will announce each of the three presenters and give you a little biographic information on them, and they will then come out in order. Craig Fox holds the Hosu Wu Term Chair of Management at the Anderson School at UCLA and also is a professor of psychology there. He's the co-director of the Interdisciplinary Research Group in Behavioral Decision Making. His extensive research focuses primarily on behavior under risk, uncertainty, and ambiguity using methods such as field studies, laboratory experiments, and brain imaging. Dr. Fox is the founding president of the Behavioral Science and Policy Association and also is interested in applying behavioral economics and social psychology to improving health care and financial decision making. He is co-editor of Behavioral Science and Policy and serves on the board of editors of the Journal of Behavioral Decision Making and Judgment and Decision Making. Dr. Fox will discuss with us today the importance of studying clinician behavior as it relates to decision science. Our next presenter is Jason Doctor, or is he Dr. Squared or Dr. Doctor? He's an associate professor in the School of Pharmacy and director of health informatics here at the Leonard D. Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics at USC. Jason specializes in applying behavioral economic models within health and medicine, focusing particularly on decision making. Dr. Doctor leads a federally funded multi-site cluster randomized clinical trial that evaluates behavioral economics approaches to improving physician adherence to comparative effective treatments. And Dr. Doctor will present a non-monetary social motivators paper today. Kevin Volk has many impressive titles to include, more than I can get in the right order. He is founding director of the Center for Health Incentives and Behavioral Economics and professor of healthcare management at the Leonard Davis Institute at the Wharton School and Vice Chair of Health Policy and Medical Ethics, co-director at the Penn Medical Medicine Center for Innovation and 
He also is professor of medicine at the Perlman School of Medicine, all, you guessed it, at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Volp focuses on the impact of financial and organizational incentives on health outcomes and has been published in the New England Journal and a variety of other places, many, many papers. He served as an advisor to important entities such as Horizon Blue Cross and Blue Shield, McKinsey and Caremark, and has been covered in many important media outlets. Please welcome me in greeting first Dr. Craig Fox, and we will now begin the session. Thank you to Commonwealth, to Debbie, and to Jason for uh, this kind invitation to speak to you today. Uh, I'm going to talk about nudging healthcare provider behaviors, and that raises the question, why am I interested in influencing provider behavior? Uh, there are a few reasons. First of all, I think most applications of behavioral economics today are focused on patient behaviors, medical adherence, dieting, exercise, inoculations, and so forth. Uh, as most of you know, of course, provider behavior is at least as important to public health as patient behavior for several reasons, of course, preventable. Preventable medical errors are a leading uh, cause of death in this country. Uh, provider behavior strongly influences patient behavior. And, and then there's the problem of unnecessary procedures that inflate the cost of health care. Um, the other reason I'm interested is I think provider behavior is actually easier to influence and monitor. There are fewer critical decisions and actions, usually in a fixed location, often mediated by technology, which is uh, ripe for interventions using behavioral science. The challenge, of course, is that you might argue that experts uh, may be less influenced by the kinds of interventions. Uh, that, of course, is an empirical question. As most of you know, the neoclassical view of uh, healthcare provider behavior is the neoclassical view of economic behavior, that providers are rationally self-interested. Um, and if you have that view of the world, then that means you have a fairly limited tool set uh, first of all, of course, you can align monetary incentives in the right way. Uh, pay for performance, for instance, is a common intervention technique. You can rely on interventions that uh, include uh, information and education, giving providers the right kind of information to hopefully uh, influence the right kind of decision making. Or you can use some, some form of formal regulation, curtail their options or mandate particular behaviors. The behavioral perspective is a little bit different, uh, and that is that healthcare providers are not fully rational agents, but they're also, uh, not only do they fall short of those Olympian standards of rationality, but they're also interested in, uh, uh, in their peers and the performance of their peers and how they're viewed by their peers, and so that social influences can be at least as important as financial motives. Um, and the philosophy uh, that one might use in applying a behavioral intervention is what uh, Thaler and Sunstein in their book Nudge call libertarian paternalism. We can preserve their freedom of choice while actually nudging people to make better decisions if we're mindful of the kinds of biases that they're given to. And this draws on behavioral economics and social psychology. This introduces several new points of uh, leverage that I'll very quickly uh, review in my remaining time. Uh, one of the most important is uh, electronic health record systems or medical informatics systems. Uh, of course, the traditional way of doing this is through active decision support. If we know, for instance, that healthcare providers are not very good at Bayesian inference, then we actually do the calculations for them using Bayes' theorem. Uh, of course, in uh, radiology, uh, using uh, computer-assisted diagnosis has, has become very important. But once you start to introduce these kinds of uh, decision analytic interventions, the behavioral perspective suggests that one needs to be sensitive to, to how they're used. Um, there are some behavioral issues that remain. For instance, there's some work by a group uh, out of Britain finding that computer-assisted diagnosis can actually inflate the race of, rate of false negatives in diagnosis as the uh, physicians become uh, get a false sense of security that nothing, there's no tumor there, for instance. Um, framing, we know, can influence people's decisions if there are studies Tversky, Pocker, and Sox in the 80s, for instance, showing that if you present information on outcomes in a survival frame, people tend to be more risk averse. If you present the same information in a mortality frame, uh, they tend to be more risk seeking. And, and then there are presentation effects. We can give people the right probabilities, but uh, how that information is presented uh, can sometimes have a profound influence on the choices that they make. We can also provide uh, more subtle intervention through passive decision support, providing the information people need to make their decisions and just making it easily convenient, reminders of patient histories, the medications they're on, different treatment options through EHRs is a classic way of doing this. Checklists are important, and Atul Gawande has written about this recently. 
Um, it is important to remember that how you present the information, once again, can be very important. What kinds of metrics for dosing, for instance. By way of analogy, there's some work by Jack uh, Saul and uh, Rick Larrick at uh, Duke that came out a few years ago on decisions about cars. For instance, if you're thinking about trading your clunker that gets 10 miles per gallon for one that gets 12 and a half miles per gallon, or you're thinking about trading in your spouse's car that gets 25 miles per gallon for one that gets 40 miles per gallon, most people would take the latter. Miles per gallon, it turns out, is a very uh, misleading metric because what we're really interested in is how many gallons per fixed number of miles. And indeed, if we translate this metric into gallons per 100 miles, we see that the first trade saves two gallons in 100 miles, whereas the second only one and a half, and actually it'd be a better decision to trade in the clunker. So putting the information in the right metric actually can facilitate better uh, decision making, and I think there are opportunities in healthcare to do the same. Uh, a classic way now that, uh, that we're now starting to, to, to look at uh, more and more is choice architecture, setting up characteristics of the choice environment in ways that promote better decisions. Uh, defaults is a big way that many of you are probably familiar with. This picture is taken from a famous paper on uh, organ donation rates in European countries. The yellow bars are organ donation rates in countries that have opt-in uh, policies like California, for instance, you put a donor dot in to opt in to being a, a donor, whereas other countries in Europe have exactly the opposite, presumed consent. Uh, and your grandmother probably could have told you it would have made a difference, but she probably wouldn't have told you it would make a difference uh, this, this big. 15% or so is the rate in opt-in countries, whereas countries with similar demographics that are opt-out have about 99% uh, donation rates. Uh, I mentioned framing as a choice architecture technique. Ordering is also important. Uh, there's a lot of research showing that the first uh, items on ballots, the first items on menus tend to get uh, a higher market share, and the same presumably is true on EHRs. Uh, also, it turns out the way that you group items in an EHR can make a difference, and I'll give you one illustration from some work uh, on a, a grant that uh, Jason Doctor is a PI on, um, led by a postdoc of mine, David Tannenbaum. We approached practicing physicians in the Chicago area, and we presented them with a lot of upper respiratory infection cases, hypothetical cases, and then we simply manipulated the way in which we grouped the treatment options. Sometimes we listed separately, as you see here, the less aggressive treatment options, and we grouped the more aggressive treatment options, and sometimes we did the opposite. We also counterbalanced the order. It turned out that this had a big effect on prescribing behavior. Uh, if the aggressive treatment options, such as uh, prescription medications or broad spectrum antibiotics, were unpacked so that they were listed separately, they got a higher market share, presumably, because they were more salient. So it le led to a big effect. This is a simple case of your nudging using libertarian paternalism in the sense that you're still providing a, a freedom of choice to your healthcare providers, but you're just using a little bit of insight into uh, the biases that people are given to to nudge them in the direction of making a perhaps a better or more guideline concordant decision. Um, you can also, of course, use feedback. And um, we're doing some trials right now where we give feedback to physicians on their rate of inappropriate antibiotic prescription for uh, non-bacterial viral uh, 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 upper respiratory infections, and that, that can have an effect. Um, and you can use some social influences that Jason is going to talk about in his presentation. Um, I think there are also opportunities through monitoring and feedback to use behavioral interventions. Directly monitoring behavior and providing feedback can help rewire people's habits. I think a great example of this is hand washing, where there's obviously, which is responsible for a lot of, uh, of uh, infections in hospitals. Um, there are a lot of trials now that are going on. Here's one where people's hand washing behavior is monitored through uh, video cameras and they're given feedback and in this particular uh, trial, it had a huge effect on compliance with hand washing at those key moments when entering and when exiting patient encounters. A third, you can monitor the clinical environment. Signage is important, and Jason will give an example of that in his presentation. Another example is a study where signs were put up to remind doctors to uh, wash their hands, either with a control message, a gel in, wash out, a personal message, protect your health by washing your hands, or a patient-oriented message, protect your patient's health, and you might guess which one was most effective here. All right, got it. Actually, the patient reminder, kind of encouragingly, uh, focusing on the patient's health was most effective. So there's a lot of psychology that goes into tuning these messages. Uh, and, and how you arrange the environment can have profound effects on hand washing, where mirrors are, where dispensers are, flags to indicate that something is empty, needs to be refilled, and so forth. Um, 
fourth, you can modify the workflow and various procedures. One thing I think is very important is to think about reporting protocols. There's a bias in decision making that we tend to be more critical of sins of commission than sins of omission. And so a lot of bad behaviors don't get reported. I was talking a few years ago with an anesthesiologist at UCLA who observed that oftentimes in her training, uh, some of the trainees extubate patients when they're coming out of surgery prematurely. And of course, typically the patient just sort of gags <laughs> and they uh, re-intubate and there's no harm, no foul, and nobody wants to report it. In so doing, you miss a learning opportunity um, to, uh, to learn the conditions under which you're, you're providing proper care or improper care. So I think reporting protocols is an important tool. Of course, checklists is mentioned, and Otul Gawande has written about this. Group decision protocols. Scheduling is very important as well. Uh, there's a lot of research now on decision fatigue, that as people get tired, they tend to take the path of least resistance in decision making. For instance, a former student of mine uh, who's at Stanford University did a study of uh, Israeli judges and found that as they got more and more tired over the course of the day, they were, more, they were less uh, likely to grant parole to prisoners that were in front of them. And then they had a lunch uh, breakfast break and the rate would go up. Uh, and then it uh, would go down as they got more tired. And we've, we found a similar thing uh, happening in, uh, uh, with antibiotic prescription in the opposite direction. Um, and then there are behavioral incentives that uh, Kevin will talk about in his presentation using behavioral economics to think about how to get more bang for the buck. Um, so that's a um, fairly aggressive agenda. Lots of opportunities, I think, for behavioral economics and social psychology and healthcare behavior. And then just closing, I just want to draw your attention to uh, the new journal uh, that I'm co-editing called Behavioral Science and Policy that's a nice outlet for this kind of work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.